Hi, and welcome to our video about pi bond electrophiles. In part A, we're going to be talking about details about the Grignard and organolithium reactions as they react with pi electrophiles. In order to make a Grignard reagent, we can do a reaction known as an oxidative insertion. So we take an alkyl halide, so that means a group of alkyl part and a halide part. So the halide could be bromine, chlorine, Iodine, fluorine does not work well. Then we dissolve magnesium. This is a solid, it comes with two electrons. When it does so, that magnesium inserts itself between the carbon and the bromine. Magnesium currently has an oxidation state of zero. And after it inserts, it will end up with an oxidation state of plus two. Notice that the two electrons from the magnesium are now over between the CH2 and the magnesium. So we've retained the same number of electrons overall. Now what that does, we've gone from having a CH2 carbon next to the leaving group that was delta positive. We've changed its reactivity so that now it's delta negative with the magnesium, the metal, being delta positive. So now this carbon is nucleophilic. It's important to remember that those RM species, like Grignard reagents and organolithium reagents, are strong nucleophiles, but they're also strong bases. So we have to make sure that any solvent we use for the reaction to dissolve the reagent and allow the reaction to continue, the solvent must be polar aprotic. So polar means the molecule has a dipole. Aprotic means that the molecule does not have an acidic proton. Usually that means a proton on a heteroatom. So good solvent choices are polar aprotic, such as diethyl ether. Notice that there's no hydrogen on the oxygen heteroatom, so there's no protic or acidic proton. Tetrahydrofuran is another good choice. It's a cyclic version of diethyl ether. Because it's cyclic, it will have a higher boiling point than diethyl ether. So this is very useful in organic reactions. Bad solvent choices are polar protic solvents, such as ethanol. Notice that the ethanol has a hydrogen on a heteroatom. So if we tried to use something like ethyl magnesium bromide in a reaction and had ethanol as a solvent, all that's going to happen is an acid-base reaction between the Grignard reagent and the solvent. This acid-base reaction is going to favor the product side. And because acid-base reactions are very, very fast, this is the reaction that will happen instead of this nucleophile going to react with the carbonyl, which is usually the desired reaction when we're talking about a Grignard reaction. So ethanol is a bad choice of solvent because an undesired reaction would take place. Similarly, water or other product solvents would be bad choices. One exception to this is if we're using sodium borohydride. So sodium borohydride is a fairly strong nucleophile, but it's not as strong of a base. And so reactions with sodium borohydride usually actually work best in polar protic solvents such as ethanol. A little bit of an acid-base reaction will take place between the two species, but not so much that it's a detriment to the reaction. Now if you were using lithium aluminum hydride, that is a very, very strong base to the point that it can actually catch on fire in the presence of protic solvents such as water. So if you're using lithium aluminum hydride, it's very important to keep water away from the reaction. Notice if we tried to use water over here, or even if there was, we used glassware that was wet. So here's the phenyl magnesium bromide. And if we tried to use water, or if there was any water present, an acid-base reaction would quickly take place. So we can draw this metal, non-metal, in its ionic form. Alternatively, you can do the reaction right from the covalent form. That helps us see that an acid-base reaction will take place, and that acid-base reaction will favor the products. The bottom line is that we cannot have a Grignard reagent in the presence of water if we want a Grignard reaction to take place. Now you'll very often see in these Grignard reactions, such as the one shown over on the right, H3O plus. 
So we're going to look for a second at what H3O plus is exactly. Now we can't get an ion like this just out of a bottle. You can't pour in H3O plus. So what H3O plus represents is that we've taken some acid and dissolved it in water. So for example, we might have taken hydrochloric acid and dissolved that in water. And if water is in a huge excess, an acid-base reaction will take place between the two. And that's how we get this H3O plus species in solution. Other acids can be used. Another common one would be something like ammonium chloride. So keep in mind that the strongest acid that can ever exist in, in water is H3O plus. If we ever use an acid that's stronger than H3O plus, that acid will just react with water to generate this product. So the strongest acid that can ever exist in water is H3O+. Now we're going to look at reaction coordinate diagrams. So as we look at a reaction coordinate diagram, the first thing is to revisit the mechanism of the reaction. So we have a first step of the reaction, the Grignard reagent and the ketone or aldehyde, ketone in this case. So by doing that reaction, we generate this intermediate shown on the bottom left. Remember that we've numbered the steps, meaning that it's only the Grignard reagent present right now. The H3O plus is not there yet. In the second step of the reaction, we add H3O plus, which, as we discussed, is something like hydrochloric acid dissolved in water. We have an acid-base reaction that generates the neutral product and water. So notice that we have two steps in this reaction. For each step, there's going to be one transition state. There's one intermediate, second transition state leading to the product. So when we go to draw the reaction coordinate diagram, we have energy on the y-axis, reaction coordinate, or progress of the reaction on the x-axis. We'll start with species that are fairly high in energy, quite reactive, go through a higher energy transition state, then go down in energy to species that have slightly lower energy. That's still not neutral, so the reaction, we don't want to stop the reaction here. In the second step of the reaction, that's when we add in the acid. And we get to the neutral, more stable, lower energy final product. So we can label all the species A. There's A. B. There's the intermediate, B and the final product, C. So when you're drawing a reaction coordinate diagram, remember to label the axes. Then there's one hump or one transition state for every step of the reaction. You should have the same number of wells as you have intermediates or products in the reaction. So we have A, B, and C. That means we have three low energy points, A, B, and C. So in summary from part A, you saw that we can perform an oxidative insertion of an alkyl halide to give us a Grignard reagent. We saw that Grignard reagents and organolithium reagents are strong bases. And because of that, polar aprotic solvents must be used, and we have to make sure there's no water anywhere nearby when we do the reaction in the lab. We saw that H3O plus hydronium comes from dissolving an acid in water. And the strongest acid that can exist in water is H3O plus. We draw a reaction coordinate diagram to describe the energy changes that take place over the course of a reaction.